Greetings, and welcome to the Lou Holtz Podcast. As we've said many times, this show is not about whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, white, black, yellow, any color in between. It's about the culture of this country. Any great organization, whether it be a country or a business, is determined by the culture. And we've lost an awful lot of our cultures, and we feel very blessed today to have an individual who's helped the culture of this country greatly. Coach Joe Kennedy is a 20-year veteran of the Marines, was assistant coach for the Bremerton High School varsity football team. Before he'd even coached his first game, the Marine turned football coach made a commitment to God that he would give thanks at the conclusion of each game for the opportunity to work with young people and the opportunity to coach such a great game and be able to influence people's lives through football. This was met with disapproval from the school district that turned into a lengthy court battle. On June 27, 2022, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Coach Kennedy and the First Amendment Right, and on March 8th, 2023, Coach Kennedy was officially reinstated as assistant coach. Joe and his wife, Denise, who reside currently in Pensacola, Florida. A film inspired by his life is in development, and he continues to speak across the country, promoting freedom of speech. His new book, Average Joe, is available for purchase nationwide. So we're very, very delighted to welcome Joe Kennedy. It's our pleasure to have you on this show. And you've been through so much the last couple of years. Thank you, Coach. Before we get into that, but first I'd like to hear how you got your start in coaching. Can you share a little bit about your background? Yeah, so um, I was too small to play high school football. Uh, I was just a little guy. I was always in trouble. I got kicked out of every single school I ever went to, always fighting. I was an angry kid. I needed to find some place to put all that anger, and it seemed like the Marine Corps was the right place to go because I was in group homes and foster homes and boys' homes. So I grew up without really a good family or any role models in my life. And after I joined the Marine Corps, and that, that was it. I, I found what I thought was my calling at the time. And then after I retired from the Marine Corps, man, God got a hold of me. And next thing I know, I'm coaching high school football. Yeah, not a greater profession than that because, you know, you can make a lot of money, Joe, but when you die, that is. But when you're in coaching, you have a chance to be significant. That's where you help other people be successful. And that lasts many a lifetime. Now, this has amazed me. You're a former atheist. Why did you decide to start praying at the end of football games? Yeah, so right when I was getting out of the Marine Corps, uh, I was a heathen. I, I had no faith whatsoever. I thought, you know, God was just one of those good fairy tales that they tell people. Well, I met up with my childhood sweetheart and we weren't evenly yoked. I, I was failing horribly as a as a husband and a father, and I desperately needed help. I had no, there's no guide to help you become a better husband or, or to be a father. And next thing I know, I'm up on the altar and I, I'm telling, telling God, I said, if you give me my wife, I'll give you my life. So I dedicated my life to him. And about a, not even a year later, I, I just got approached to start coaching football. Now, I don't know anything about football, which is really interesting. And yeah, so they uh, they offered me the job and I watched Facing the Giants. And um, man, I tell you that God got a hold of my heart again. And I, I was on my knees and I said, God, I'm going to give you the glory after every game, win or lose, right there on the on the battlefield. Well, you know, I find this, Joe, that having a faith in God does not eliminate you from problems. But what it does do, it enables you to handle them. I don't know how people handle difficulties and problems without a strong faith in God. As a coach, I believe the success of a team is largely dependent upon the culture of the team. What type of culture did you try to build on your football team and with your players? That's where I was really, really blessed. I, I When I started coaching, as I said, I didn't know anything about football, but we were surrounded by some great uh coaches that had all the X's and O's down. We had uh, guys that played in college, professional, a couple that played in in the uh, NFL and even in the Super Bowl. So we had the X's and O's completely covered. 
my my role just seemed to fit perfectly where where I found what my true calling was, and that was to help these young men become better young men. We needed discipline, we needed leadership, and we needed somebody to build a team around these guys. And that's what it all was about. I, I didn't really care much about the, the game of football. I just cared about the people that were actually playing the game of football. And I worried about them day and night um, at school, on the field, at home their families. So I, I got to be that guy that was really close to them, be their mentor, their friend, their coach, their big brother, uh, sometimes uh, the bad guy. But yeah, it was all about just developing those young men. You know, as a young man, Joe, I was an officer in the Army. And I learned more in the military than I ever learned in the college classroom about coaching. And the one thing you find out in the military is the obligation you have to your fellow soldier. And that's what life is all about, the obligation I have. And yesterday we had uh, Bubba Cunningham on, and he reminded me of a saying I said all the time. The difference between people today and 40 years ago. Today everybody wants to talk about their rights and their privileges. 40 years ago people talked about their obligations and their responsibilities. With your background as a Marine, what was your reaction when you found out you were being fired? for expressing a freedom, you'd put your life on the line in the military. What was your reaction when you found that out? That, oh, you can't have freedom of religion. So that's where I, I didn't know what to think at the time. Uh, these guys are my friends. I've worked with this team for and, and the school district for, man, almost a decade. My wife worked for the school district. And let me tell you, I, this was something that none of us wanted to go through. But the, the very thought of somebody having to choose between their faith and, and their job is just, it, to me, it's absolutely ridiculous in this day and age. And especially for for something as simple as, as being thankful and giving a word of prayer after a football game. So I went through all the emotions. I went through being mad. I was surprised. I was stunned. I was in denial. I went through everything. But it, it was absolutely something I had to do for all Americans because nobody should have to choose between their job and their faith. You know, there always comes a time, Mojo, where you have to make a decision, do I run or do I fight? Do you remember the moment you made the decision to stand there and fight for your principal? Yes, I do. I was sitting in front of, in front of my team. It was uh, uh, Thursday, our pregame, uh, before our Friday night lights. And I was sitting out in front of my team, and I had them all kneeling there, and we're talking to them, and I was keeping them updated on everything that was going on. And my team captain looked at me and said, Coach, we talked as a team, and we're all in agreement. Can't you just give in to the school district and, and make this a whole lot easier and stay our coach? And I knew right at that exact second, that was the reason why I had to not give up and had to keep fighting. Because I tell these guys, you know, to fight until there's nothing left on the clock. Now, all of a sudden, I'm faced with this in real life, and I get to be that that, that example for them. I, could you imagine me saying, oh, yeah, give me everything you got until it becomes complicated or it becomes painful or, you know, puts you through a little bit of hardship? No, that... That's where I had to draw the line. In the third and fourth quarter of a football game, you got to keep going. I don't care how tired you are, I don't care how painful it is. You just got to keep going and you got to finish. There's still time on the clock. That's what I've always coached and now I have to actually live by it. And I said, yeah, it would be a lot easier, but that's not the right thing to do. So I was, I was doing the leadership by example and I, I stuck to it from that moment on. Very well expressed on that line. On June 27, 2022, you won your Supreme Court case. Can you walk us through that day and how you find out? And what was your reaction you found out you had won the case? Yeah, well, going to the Supreme Court was pretty much anticlimactic. We we went to the Supreme Court twice, and uh, you know, you you at the at the lower courts, it, it's just ridiculous how how the court systems work today. And I, that it's not they don't rule on on the law in the Constitution, which I found out. And so my only hope was at the Supreme Court, who their, their sole purpose is to do you know everything by the Constitution. And so when uh, when they heard my case, I thought we had a really good chance. I really believed we were gonna we were gonna win. And when we finally got the decision, we were kind of all in shock because here it was for 
this was uh, uh, eight football seasons that we've been fighting this to get back onto the football field, and all of a sudden, here it is. Today you won. Congratulations. Thank you so much. This is, it's crazy. I, I, it hasn't processed yet. And, man, there's no better feeling in the world to know that what you did was right after all this time. In your opinion, what does winning this case mean? for the future of America and religious freedom, Joe. So the only thing I asked for was uh, to be a coach and be able to pray after a football game. I had no idea this was going to launch something so big, but God's got other plans, obviously. And it, there's a big cry cry out um, for the obligations, like you said, for, for people to be good citizens and to uh, understand what it means to be an American. And that's what the Supreme Court did is they just opened up the, the First Amendment and gave us the religious liberty that we're supposed to have. I mean, it's really easy to read the First Amendment and the freedom of speech and the freedom you know, of, of religion and the free exercise. Those all work absolutely together and they're not opposing uh, forces. And that's what the Supreme Court did is just clarified that and got rid of bad case law, which has been on the books for, I don't know, 50 something years. So we have more religious freedom now than probably you and I have had in our entire lifetime. And that's just a great place for America to be where we can open the doors and not have to hide our faith in the public square and at our schools. We could totally be, you know, who we are and and express our faith in the way that we want to. I know you've had the opportunity to meet President Trump on several occasions as I have. What was your reaction the first time you met him? How did you get to know him, and what are your thoughts now? Thank you very much. Mr. President, uh, Coach yes. Kennedy, uh, we Coach. talked a few times. Uh, I coach over in Bremerton High School right. in Bremerton, Washington, and I was fired for praying after football games. Right. And it's just so nice to have First Liberty um, representing me and having a president that has the guts to stand up for us. So I appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Coach. You're up. Good coach, too. <laughs> He's a good coach. Yeah, another another one of those coincidences. I I happened to be at an event that Mike Berry uh, invited me to, so I was just a guest sitting in the back of the room, and uh, Trump started talking and started telling my story right there in front of all these people. And- I think that is absolutely outrageous. I think it's outrageous. I think it's very very sad and outrageous. Okay, religious liberty. Hey, it's about religious liberty. And there has to be a a melding of both. We're living in a time where you have to have a melding of both. But it's very unfair what they're doing to religion in this country. And Mike and I looked at each other and we're like, oh, my God, he's talking about us. Somebody interrupted him and said, excuse me, Mr. President, he's sitting in the back of the room. So that was kind of like the the bull rush of, of how I got to meet him. And we, we talked for a while, and then he invited me back to the Oval Office and to the Rose Garden. And I, I tell you, he, he is not a politician, and that's what I love most about him. He is the guy who will tell you straight how it is, and, you know, he, he's a lot like me. He's got a lot of fire in his gut, and I, I actually punched him in the shoulder uh, when I was in the, in the Oval Office. And, yeah, the Secret Service didn't like that, but Trump thought it was uh, pretty funny. So that, that guy, is, he's a good guy. I, I agree with you completely. He does tell you exactly what he feels, even if it isn't what you want to hear. Now, after you've been through everything, Joe, would you change anything from the beginning? I, I would have to say no. I, I, I can't think of, I, I wish, you know, you hindsight's always twenty twenty. You think about your football games that you coach and you wish you could have done this or wish you could have done that. But everything plays out exactly the way that it should. And everything had to happen exactly the way that, I, uh, that it went through. I, I would like to say, yeah, I wish we could have handled this like adults. I wish um, the school district would have, just, you know, sat, sat there and said, yeah, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is a 30-second prayer on, on a football field after a game. That That's not newsworthy. That's not something that needs to go to the Supreme Court. That is no big deal. And that's what it should have been from the very beginning. So, But God had other plans, and our country really needed somebody to stand up and say enough was enough. And all this nonsense that's going on, we, we just got to stand up and say, you know, hey, no more, not on my watch. Well, you know, we talk about culture, and the culture of this company has always been, if it's wrong, let's write it. And what they did to you was completely wrong, and the country did write it, but unfortunately, we don't do that enough. 
Now, I know after everything you've been through, you have four children. And a guy told me one time, I don't care what you accomplish in life, if you're successful as a husband or father, you failed. But going through this, how's it been, how's your family handled this? How have you handled it with your children? Well, my kids, they, I actually had two kids in the high school at the time when this was all started. So it was live and center. Um, my wife, she was, uh, she worked for the school district. She was the HR director for Bremerton School District. And you can imagine having to sue your wife and really having her fire you for praying. It, it causes a little anxiety and uh, some stress between the family. Um, my, my kids, they thought it was cool because we were trending on, on Twitter and on Facebook. And I think my son, the only reason he knew what was going on is because we were on the cover of Sports Illustrated and ESPN. So, But we all made it through together. God really had to bind us together and, and showed us what we were made of as a family and we, how deeply rooted we were in each other and, and with the Lord. Well, that's great. What advice would you give to Christians who are afraid to stand up for their faith because of all the backlash and the negative things that people are going to say? How, what, what advice would you give them? It's the most simplest thing. I, you know, I've racked my brain on this so many times why people just don't stand up for what is right. And that's what they need to do is just do what is right. We know right from wrong. And, and we're not a, a, a America is not a, a country where we're supposed to be afraid and living in fear. It takes a strong man to, to lead his family and to stand up for what is right. So more people need to stand up for what they believe in and let God take care of the rest of it. It is so simple as doing the right thing. And that's the only thing we need to do. Let God handle the rest. The church of tennis has really deteriorated the last couple of years. What is it? Why are people leaving their faith? Uh, I don't know how people get by without it. As I said, because you have faith in God doesn't mean you aren't going to have problems. I'm an old man, as I said. My birthday candles cost more than a kirk, but the one thing I understand, you're always going to have problems, you're always going to have difficulty. I don't care how old you are. You're going to have problems, you're going to have difficulty, but having a faith in God enables you to get through it. Why do you think that we have lost so many uh, churchgoers in recent years? You know, that's a fascinating question. The whole breakdown of our system just seems to be collapsing. Uh, the family environment itself, I think, is probably one of the root causes of that. Fathers are not being fathers. They're, moms are trying to, you know, do the best they can, but dads are not being dads for these kids. And the, if you don't have a strong family environment, things are just going to go downhill. You need to be an absolute leader of your family and have some have some respect for your family that you're going to take them and, and bring them to church and have them teach them about faith. And, you know, of course, it's up to them if they want to continue on with that. But growing your kids in a church and, and having that faith and believing in something, I think it's, it's the cornerstones of America. And if you don't believe in, in, in something, what do you believe in? Absolutely nothing. And I think that's where we're at today, that more people need to, you know, get off their butts, get into church, be involved in their communities. And also, I think uh, preachers need to really preach the word. I think they've gotten really soft and tried to make everything so... Uh, politically correct. We don't want to address the things that are really going on. They're afraid to talk government and politics. And how else are we going to learn this unless it's, it's within in our communities? So, yeah, we need to get our act together. You know, about 30 years ago, Time Magazine asked me to write an article on what this country would be like in 30 years, which I did. And the one thing I said is the breakup of the family. And I can almost pinpoint when the culture of this country started to go downhill. And that was when Linda Johnson came out with the Great Society. We said, we don't need men in the family. We're going to pay you to have children. The more children you have, the more we'll pay you. But you can't have a father in there. And that's when everything started going down. The, the, the demise of the family, the, the demise of the family. And, and that's when so many of our problems happened. As I say, I'm an old man. I remember that well. But... The theme of my show is getting back the culture of this country. What do you think we have to do to get the culture back, Joe? 
Wow. You know, that's the million dollar question. Unfortunately, it seems that we need some kind of a catalyst to make this happen. Uh, you remember 9-11, Pearl Harbor. You think about these horrific things that have happened in our society, even even the uh, fires in Maui, um, in Hawaii. You, you think about these things, that brings our country together. And it's so sad that we have to wait till something absolutely horrible happens. When we have the prime time, to, when things are good, that's when we really should be rejoicing and being proud of who we are and really take advantage of it. Not wait until we have some catastrophic event to bring us together. We we have the full rights and the means and, and the ability to do it right now. So I think, uh, yeah, I think it starts with, uh, you know, me getting on my knees and thanking God and, and other guys just stepping up and actually being the role models. I, I grew up with, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood's and, uh, you know, John Wayne's. I, I think the strong male role model needs to come back. And, it, hey, that's that, that's up to the guys. We need to get off our butts and get busy and, and be men. You know, statistics prove, Joe, that a child that comes out of a two-parent home has a much better chance to graduate, become a good citizen, stay out of jail, things along that line. And for so many years, the poor father was really set aside as he really wasn't important, but it is ultra important now. As we get ready to wrap this up, Joe, and I thank you so much for being my guest. What's in the future for you now? Where do you go from here? <laughs> Another million dollar question. Right now, I, I'm learning uh, actually about the Bible. I, I'm going to college right now with my wife. We're going to the uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary because I, I don't really even know the Bible that well. And so I, I'm, I'm starting out, I think, in the right way and, and starting in my roots and, and, and figuring out, you know, who God is and what he really means to me and my family. From there, I, I don't know. I'm going to keep speaking, and I'm going to go where God, God calls me to go. I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know where, when, how. I, I, I'm i just in a moment right now where I, I'm waiting for God to, to call me because here I am, and I'm ready to go. My son always said, you want to make God laugh, you tell him what your plans are. And yeah. you just have to put your faith in him and move on with him. But You've been a real credit and a real pleasure to have you on this show, and God bless you. Look forward to seeing you down in, uh, uh, I guess it's Fort Worth in a week or two. Look forward to it then. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Coach. It's been an honor to meet you and talk with you. I'll see you soon, my friend.